Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tabor Swatsky. I'm with Gopher, and I would like to welcome all of you to today's Gopher Solutions webinar. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, this is a monthly webinar focusing on a variety of physical education subjects and topics. Past webinar topics have included PE teachers presenting on specific activities like assessment, fitness, classroom management, and PE advocacy. Past presenters have included Dr. Robert Pangrazy, Dr. John Medina, and Jean Blades. Our presenters have done a great job of bringing useful topics and information to the field of physical education. Our webinars will almost always occur the third week of the month, and all attendees of today's webinar will receive a certificate of participation for one hour of educational credit. Also today, all attendees will be entered to win a 15-pack of our FitStep Pro uploadable pedometers, a $429 value. Our uploadable FitStep pedometers not only track steps, but they also track activity time and activity time in the MVPA or Moderate to Vigorous Physical Activity Zone as well. Today's webinar is titled Technology in Physical Education with Dr. Lisa Witherspoon. And before I introduce Lisa, I wanted to mention that you will have the chance to ask questions during the presentation. And Lisa will try to get to some of the questions even, even as she's presenting um, as they pertain to the presentation. And then if we have some other ones too, we can get to those at the end. So um, if something comes up that you're thinking of, go ahead and ask that question on the right-hand side of your screen in the questions area. Those questions are only visible to myself and to um, Dr. Witherspoon, so feel free to ask away throughout the presentation. And like I said, anything that we don't get to um, during the presentation, we'll, we'll, we'll get to as many of those at the end. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, Assistant Professor at the University of South Florida, Dr. Lisa Witherspoon. Lisa is an Assistant Professor at the University of South Florida in the Department of Teaching and Learning, where she is part of the Physical Education Teacher Education Faculty. Dr. Witherspoon serves as the director of the USF Active Gaming Research Laboratories and is an international expert on the subject of technology-driven games and exercise with a grounded passion in using technology to reach children in the 21st century. In addition, she serves on national committees and advisory boards related to physical education, technology, active gaming, sports, and fitness concepts. She also serves as the PE Central Active Gaming Managing Editor and has been elected as an inaugural iTeach Fellow at the University of South Florida to assist future teachers and current faculty in using technology in the classroom. Dr. Witherspoon is in, is in the Virginia Tech University Hall of Fame, Catawba Valley Hall of Fame, Newton Conover Hall of Fame, and was inducted into the ACC Legends Class of 2011 for women's basketball. She has designed and implemented various basketball camps all over the country to help young athletes acquire the fundamental skills necessary to feel confident and competent to progress in movement development. Her continued passion is to meet generations where they are in terms of interests and desires in order to help guide individuals in gaining and or maintaining physical, physically active lifestyles. At this time, I will turn it over to our presenter. It's all yours, Lisa. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining in. Um, today's topic is going to be focused on technology, which is <clears throat> obviously extremely broad. But we are going to have an opportunity to have two parts to this particular webinar, and then future webinars that I will be presenting with will go a little more deeply into the different specific areas of different types of technology. So they will be more identified at that, that point in detail. <clears throat> While we talk about technology today, many of you are already probably using technologies in your classroom of, of some sort. Others of you might be concerned about how to use it, what parts of technology is going to be beneficial to your classroom. So this first part of the webinar, I am hoping will give everyone an understanding and a confidence level of the idea of how to how to teach it in your classroom, how to plan to use it, and then the second part will be in more detail about the different types of technology. Um, this particular screen here, I really like this quote. I use it in, in my classroom when I prepare uh, teachers to teach physical education, and it really makes sense if, you know, technology is not technology if it was invented before you were born. 
So we're used to television, we're used to cars, we're used to that type of technology, but today's type of technology has changed dramatically. And really the, the big reason we're doing this, um, this is my stepson and my daughter um, a few years ago, it's because playing outside, building forts, is, is really hard to find. And when you drive through neighborhoods, it, it's, really, it's really more complicated to find kids that are just outside riding bikes, you know, rolling down a hill, or building forts. So that's why it's really important for us as, as teachers to be able to leverage technology and use it. So the important part of this, this webinar is, is because society today is immersed in technology. We know that. Um, our children are born straight into it. When I was in college, I didn't even have an email address when I first started. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. And now that's just common knowledge for a, a two-year-old to be able to get on an iPad and navigate through very easily. Um, in addition, more importantly, is NASB is requiring the use of technology in, in our standards. So if you're not using some sort of technology in your classroom, it's really not considered a, a quality classroom, according to NASB. And this webinar also is going to discuss the common pedagogy problems teachers have with actually teaching using technology, and then what kind of strategies we can come up with and we can discuss that could help you implement technology into your classroom. So we look at this 21st century as a quick background, and as I had mentioned, adults, parents, that we function daily with technology and don't realize how much our children are involved with the use of technology. And not only are they influenced by parents, but they're also influenced by their peers. Um, some students had never been on social media, but they go spend the night at someone's house and all of a sudden that child has been versed in technology and social media and that's where they get introduced to it and it goes, it's just a, a drop down effect from there. Um, at, at this point, the stats are pretty outstanding, and if you look at ages 8 to 18 years of age, they, they're spending almost eight hours a day on a screen. And that could include a cell phone, an iPad or a tablet, television, but the, the numbers are pretty tremendous of how much time they're actually spending using technology. And 92% of our teens are going online daily some sort of social media. And when you look at the social media, Facebook is still the most popular with, with our teens. But then if you, if you look down, this, these are not all of the, the social media sites, but if you see how many are listed here, the fact that there's so many options of children to get on and use technology and to use these sites is a little alarming. So we, we certainly have to be aware of, of what they are doing and why this is important to even talk about. And technology isn't all negative, and I think that's a, a problem as well. A lot of us want to stay away from it. But unfortunately, it's not going away. And there are many positive effects of technology, the social connections with family and friends, even with my parents living out of state. We can FaceTime. They can talk to their granddaughter. You stay in touch with people you typically, back in the day, would never be able to stay in touch with through Facebook or texting. Um, Children are able to read blogs and forums and have discussions themselves, and they're able to express their, their feelings and emotions, um, hopefully, obviously, in a positive way, but it is a very good outlet um, as well. And then it also extends learning opportunities. At this day and age, our teenagers don't always come to us and ask us questions. They Google it. They figure it out. It provides them an opportunity to go in, and all of the questions they have, they can go in and find you know, answers or at least ideas of what that looks like themselves. And you know, GPS, the reviews of things, it, it really is a, a positive source, but we have to understand and feel comfortable with how to leverage that. So what is technology and PE? And it seems like a simple question, but I get asked this quite a bit. It is very complicated to call it one thing. Technology is a number of things. It's maybe the way you're presenting material. It could be the way you're assessing your class or a tool that you're using to help you assess your class. It could be how you're communicating. It could be you know, exercise activities that they're following on a tablet with apps. It could be videos that you're showing them so they can actually learn how to do a particular skill. 
It could be the way you enter grades. And then you've got your gizmos and gadgets, like I, I like to call them, which are more of your pedometers and heart rate monitors uh, and accelerometers. Um, teaching using any technology should be approached in a similar manner, in, in, in my opinion. It, it, and that's what we're going to get into. But it should be approached the same way you use your regular equipment already at this time. So I'm going to go through a few uh, different types of technologies. And once again, I'm not going to get into the individual ones during this webinar. That will be in part two and then uh, webinars to come on the individual ones. But one idea is the use of brain breaks. And I really like brain breaks because it is great for physical education teachers to use during rainy day activities or to help their classroom teachers incorporate more physical activity in the day without the classroom teachers having to figure out what the kids need to do. And so it's a, it's a really unique idea of uh, it's a software program that you can just pull up on the computer, project it, and use a remote control, pick certain activities, and the students follow along. So that is one, one option. Then we have our gizmos and gadgets, like I just mentioned, with pedometers, accelerometers, um, and uh, Gopher has quite a few options there for you as well. Um, but these you know, measure activity, they track activity, and are a great source of helping students understand what their activity level is. And then there's active gaming or extra gaming. I, I am sure some of you are familiar with this topic, um, but it's basically taking technology and to be able for the equipment to work, the children have to be exercising. So they're using the, the equipment as a source of an exercise or a tool. A lot of you might have heard of Dance Dance Revolution. Um, it has really kind of taken off since the 80s, has become more, much more predominant the last 10 years. Um, it's a staple in a lot of schools. You can buy multiplayer systems or you can simply have a two-pad system. But that's an example of active gaming, extra gaming. And then the other picture I have there is of uh, the funky moves. And that those are cones that light up that allow children to run. They can kick balls at them, throw at them, run and tag them. There's a lot of different modes there. But there's a lot more activities of, of extra gaming. You've heard of the Microsoft Connect probably that is a motion sensor activity game. Um, you can display it up and multiple children can be involved. Um, there's martial arts simulators. There's exercise bikes where the kids are biking, but they're inside of a video game when they're pedaling and steering and controlling the game. So there's multiple opportunities there as well. And the, the last thing really to hit on is all of the applications that are out there. Uh, there there's so many at this point, it, it's very hard to even keep up with them the, at the rate that they're coming out. But there's everything in there from such as a coach's eye where you can video students. If you're a coach, you can video your players. You can put it in slow motion. You can draw pictures on it. You can show them how they need to change their skill or their, the cues with, with how they're, they're doing that skill. They, there's multiple of those. There's apps where you can actually not worry about putting your kids into teams that you can shake them up and throw it out there and the kids know what to do. And then there's all kind of apps for muscle development. Children can watch them. If teachers aren't comfortable teaching, let's say, yoga, there's apps specifically for that where they can display it from an iPad and the children are able to learn yoga without the teacher having to be a professional demonstrating some of these activities. And then the second picture there, that's just an example of a, a health and fitness app that's focused on nutrition, that helps children plug in what they're eating to show them when they have a balanced meal, how much water they still need to drink. So there's quite a few of those out there as well, which we'll get into more detail in future webinars. The way I like to look at technology is just being a modern jump rope. It's just what jump ropes do or our regular cones, but we have to plan it the same way. How is that equipment or that technology going to help me in my classroom? So the first question I get asked multiple times as well is, do we have to have it? Do we have to use it? Well, NASPE says we should be using it. And the link that's there on the screen, you'll be able to access. And when you pull it up, you'll watch, of a, you'll watch an example of a school that refuses to use technology. 
and it functions very well. They use, back in the day, the, the traditional equipment with everything they do. It's all handwritten. It's all pencil, pencil and paper. Um, all of their equipment is the traditional equipment that we've used for years that still work. But what research has shown is those children are being left behind because they are not using the skills and the technology that is in our world today. So when you get a chance, if you have a chance, keep that link and uh, take a moment to, to look at that and, and reflect on that particular link. So this generation today is being called the E-generation, I-generation, 21st century generation. We call them all kind of things. Um, my fiance and I have other names we call them as well. That's kind of funny, but in general, it's because they are linked to technology from the get-go. This is a cute example, and I wrote it down and I videotaped it um, a couple of years ago. One is my stepdaughter, and the, the conversation that they're having if I had to choose between getting fat or getting cancer or getting a MacBook, I would so get a MacBook or may, maybe even the new iPhone 6. That was so stupid. In fact, that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, what kid wouldn't? And the, the other child says, well, Miss Lisa, meaning myself, wouldn't like that, looking at me smiling because they know I'm into exercise. And the second child says, well, I'm sorry, Miss Lisa, but you have no idea how much time we have to spend on this stuff to be good and stay popular. Parents, no offense, don't get it. And child number one laughs, says, true that, and it's so much more fun. So whether we like it or not, they're immersed in it. This is what they do. And if you look at the picture of them, two of the girls are holding their cell phones as they're on their computer. They're multitasking. And the other one's on a tablet. So the amount of technology just in that few minutes to capture just blew my mind. I, I said, wow, this is what you, you kids really do. So it kind of hit me, and I started thinking about it in terms of teaching. And when we're teaching using technology, the one thing we have to understand is the technology does not pick us. We have to choose what technology we feel is going to be beneficial. And the things we can't choose technology for is just because it's fun or just because it keeps the kids busy, they're happy, they're good, and or if it's just free. We all like free, but we just don't pick technology because of these things. And I think a lot of teachers struggle, and I get many emails through P Central that have asked me, I bought a Nintendo Wii, I have 50 kids in my class, how do I use it? Well, you don't use it with 50 kids. And that's what we're going to get into more of the bulk of, of planning using technology. But it's not something that you pick because it's fun. And that has to be one of the, the main ideas in our heads as teachers. We can't get it just because it's fun and it keeps kids busy. It's got to be effective. And number two, NASB, as I had mentioned earlier, the basis for a quality physical education program is to use technology in some way, shape, or form, because we have to keep updating our programs, learning the new modern things that are available to us, and using them in order to reach children where they're at today. And this is an example. It says it's a side-by-side uh, -side comp comparison, but that wouldn't fit on the screen, so I did it up and down. But this is just an example of the appropriate instructional practice guidelines um, through NASB, and it shows that basically with this rubric, every single level of school, elementary, middle, and high school, should be using some sort of technology to enhance the lesson's effectiveness. So based on what we should be doing for quality physical education, NASB has made that a staple. That's why it's in the standard. I show this picture to my students two different times during our program. We have a cohort, so it goes through um, juniors and seniors when they get to our program. And right when they come in, they have very little idea of what physical education really is. They are still used to programs that threw a ball out or just let kids play basketball or just let them play. There was no te real teaching involved. So when I showed them this picture at the beginning, 
they look, and I'm like, hey, you know, this is a new type of technology, and this kid is actually running. He's Jackie Chan in a video game, and he's running on this pad, and it makes Jackie Chan run, and the ninjas come out, and, you know, you get to kick the ninjas away, and it, it's a really good cardiovascular activity. So I ask him, what do you think? And some of them will say, that's awesome. You know, it, it's active. The kids are smiling. Everyone's on task. And then other students will say, well, everyone's standing around. And that's exactly correct. Developmentally appropriate practices require us to maximize participation. So this is just one example that a teacher had put up that I had seen that is not correct. This is not how we want to use technology. I really coin it as the three E's in terms of pedagogy. And just if someone's not comfortable with the word pedagogy, it's basically how we're teaching material. It's not the content, but it's how we're teaching it. And in terms of pedagogy, number one, what you choose to use has to be effective. It has to, to get you to the point that it's going to help you accomplish the objectives of your, of your lesson. If it is not going to help you do that, then it's not necessary. Number two is efficient. If it's going to take you more time using this technology than a more traditional piece of equipment, use the traditional. You want to make sure it's efficient, especially in elementary physical education when we do not get much time with our students. We're seeing them you know, here in Florida twice a week for 30 minutes, and I think a lot of states are similar, but we don't get much time with them. So using technology that's going to waste that precious time we have with them would not be appropriate. And number three, the technology's got to be excellent. It's got to work flawlessly. It can't be something that continuously breaks down that we're having to work on and, and go through. There are going to be technology difficult, difficulties with everything, but you know, given an example of if you're going to use a Wii remote that requires batteries, are you going to be the one funding the batteries? So whatever piece of equipment or whatever technology you use, are choosing to use needs to be an excellent choice that is going to be effective and efficient for you as a teacher and for the students. So here's really the meat and potatoes of, of the planning with technology. I have my students go through this and they have to visualize when I give them assignments. But the main thing is you have to say, okay, what am I teaching? So when you're looking at the scope and sequence, of your lessons and, and your curriculum. What am I teaching? So you have that idea down. And then number two, you're wanting to ask yourself, what are the objectives of my lesson? So what am I expecting them to learn at the end of lesson one, two, three, four, at the end of the unit? What am I wanting them to learn when I'm teaching them this particular content area? And then number three, how are you assessing your objectives? So how do you assess your students so you know, you know those objectives were reached? How do you know if what you were teaching was effective? Did it work? Are they improving? Are they reaching their goals? So this is really how we should be planning with everything, and it does not change when we're planning with technology. So for example, if we were to go into, I, I put a little outline here together. Let's take a content area of safe fitness, okay? So what I've done is I've written three basic objectives from the three domains. So the first one is the psychomotor do domain, the second one is the cognitive domain, the third one is the affective domain. And the SWBAT is how I shorten students will be able to. So the first one is you're wanting to see if they're going to be able to demonstrate during station how various activities improve muscular endurance. So we're focusing on muscular endurance in this particular idea. Their cognitive objective is seeing, you know, they're going to be able to identify a variety of activities that work various muscles in the body. And then the effective idea is that they're going to be respecting their peers, you know, during this activity. So Outside of that, how am I going to accomplish my objectives? What, what equipment am I going to use? Am I using cones, 
you know, what, what jump ropes, what am I using to accomplish this? So in this particular idea, I decided to use an iPad and have an iMuscle app to where they are going to be at different stations and they might have this particular app and there's plenty more than iMuscle. But the idea of iMuscle is that it basically lets the kids navigate through, they work together, they, they're able to perform different activities that will focus on the bicep. Another station might be the quadricep. Another station might be the calf muscles. But there, there's different stations and you can have an iPad at one of the stations or if financially your school provides funding, you might have three or four iPads at different stations to where the students are learning different activities that they can do to work that muscle. It also shows the muscle on the app. It's extremely educational. So the students are able to talk with each other, learn the certain muscles, and also perform a variety of activities. And then in terms of the cognitive objective, I simply put, you know, you're, you're getting them to repeat cues and, and refinements based on those particular muscle groups. And then with teacher feedback and the use of pinpointing, you're able to demonstrate and have students actually teach the classes what they've learned in that particular outline of planning. So that's just one simple idea. The technology did not replace the teaching in this situation. The technology was a tool that was used to teach the individual stations different activities, and then the teacher's job is to walk around, monitor, interject, discuss form, discuss cues, and to provide feedback. So technology in no sense should replace the actual teaching. But using an iPad in even one station, if the funding's there, just having one iPad in a station and being able to incorporate it that way is a very simple way of including technology in your classroom just through an app. Okay. And then as we move forward, I think I forgot to, to go through here, um, with the assessments in terms of uh, assessing the students, I repeated my objectives there so you could see them again. But, but at the end, you know, teacher observation, when kids turn and talk at the, at the end for closure, um, for the cognitive objective, you could have a projector that, you know, puts YouTube videos out. You can have workshops or worksheets with pencils that allow students to circle the muscle that they learned during the lesson and maybe list two activities at home that would work a bicep muscle, list two activities at home that could work your quadricep. So the idea of them then taking what they practiced and learned but then regurgitating it so you can see it on paper or you can see them demonstrating it and then leaving them with a take-home message is really what's, what's most important. So if you get the, the understanding of this, this outline, using technology does not need to be complicated. It needs to be something that easily fits in to your curriculum in terms of tools to use that is going to make your lesson and more fun. So the important parts of this part one is that technology is not going away. And I do realize there are many teachers that have been teaching for a very long time and are excellent teachers that are really kind of against the idea of, of changing and using technology because what they've been doing has been working. And I don't think the idea is to change everything, but using technology to enhance your program is, is the idea. And there are some teachers that would like to use technology that are really scared and don't understand how. And the whole idea of technology is that it should be used, but it's used like another piece of equipment. If I'm going to teach a lesson, what could I use? What's going to be there to make this lesson more effective or more beneficial for myself and for my students? And the first idea of picking any technology is making sure it's developmentally appropriate. And that's the third line there that's DAP. That's developmentally appropriate. And that's the first consideration. When you're picking out technology, if it's not developmentally appropriate based on what NASPI and Shoot America recommends, 
then we shouldn't be including those technologies in our curriculum. And just because it's fun or easy or cheap doesn't make it appropriate and effective for your classroom. And last, understanding and practice using technology before implementing. This happens a lot. Um, whenever you get a particular activity or game, especially if you're getting, you know, for example, an active gaming piece of equipment, and you put it in your classroom, if you haven't practiced it yourself, then how do you expect to understand what the children are experiencing in these activities? A simple app. An app looks great, but if you haven't really gone through and used it and clicked through it and used it effectively yourself, it's very complicated for us to understand how our children are feeling, what they're experiencing. If they get to a certain part in the app where they don't know what they're doing and you look at it and you don't know what you're doing, that's part of just not practicing and implementing it yourself, feeling comfortable. So that's, that's the main part of, of this first webinar. The second part of this webinar on May 18th is going to feed off of this basic content about basically the use of technology in PE, but then we're going to get into more of the types of technology in physical education. And more importantly, we're going to also go through how to choose that technology for your class. There are so many things to consider, things that if you haven't gone through this process, you haven't thought about. Um, recommendations, and then the most frequently encountered issues that teachers are having when they're choosing technology and when they're using those technologies. Um, at this point, um, I did not field any questions. So, That's okay. Uh, yes. Just, uh, just a reminder for our audience, and thank you so much, Lisa. Um, go ahead and ask any questions that you might have on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, I did want to let everybody know, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but this webinar is recorded and it is on our website for if you'd like to take it to your faculty meeting and share it with your, your colleagues. I know there was one person who had mentioned that they had to leave early so they can come back and visit this and, and go over it again. Um, but our first question um, that we had was a, a teacher, a physical education teacher who teaches kindergarten uh, physical education, and they were wondering, in your opinion, what technology would you feel is specific or appropriate for this age population? Yeah. And that's a great question. I actually was just in a school this morning, and the elementary physical education teacher she said, you know, at this level, you know, when you go into high school, you can you can do fun stuff because a lot of them have smartphones, so you can have them allow them to bring them in at a certain time, and you can do all kind of GPS navigation stuff, and it's a lot different when they get older. But in elementary, it is complicated. More of the technology used in elementary is more specifically going to be for the teacher to the student. So one thing I, I like with, with TeamShake, it's a particular app, and there's several out there. The kids' new names are in there, and you can give them nicknames, or they can create a name at the beginning of the year, and you have class one and all the names, or you know, Mary's class, class two. And then you hit the, the, the hat button, it looks like a magic hat, and it shakes up all the names and it just throws them out to a group. And they're all color coordinated. So now if I'm Johnny, I know I'm in group one and I'm red, and I can see who else is with me. So you're not having to group the students at all. And it's, it's a great tool to use when you're not trying to make sure you're, you're organizing you know, students together for, for level of ability, and I know sometimes that's complicated, but if you're doing cooperative learning activities or something where it really doesn't matter if Johnny can catch and Sally can't, and they end up in the same team, it's a really good idea in, in those situations. I love using, um, there, there's apps, different ones, and it depends on the phone that you have, that you can actually splice music to where if I'm doing an activity where they're moving until the music stops and then they're doing a certain activity until I say go or turn the music on, I don't have to worry about a remote control. I get my playlist set up, I play a song, it stops in between, it waits 10 seconds, however long you tell it to wait, and then it comes right back on again. And so you're just walking around giving feedback to the students and never have to worry about a remote control. So that's another idea. Um, the iPads uh, with, with the students, even at the kindergarten level, you'll be very surprised. They're extremely into it. Even if you had one iPad and it was at one station to where there were, there were certain 
uh, videos that they're watching related to a skill, uh, just any, anything that, they, they, that you have with your content area that you can find, even discussing the body. There's fun ones discussing the bodies that are very animated for, for young children. Um, so there's quite a few things that, that you can look at. Brain Breaks is perfect for kindergartners. It gets them all moving. They use cartoons, you know, sometimes, and then that's a lot of fun as well. So there are, there are many, many, many things that you can do, and in these future webinars, I will certainly be addressing ages and specific areas of the technologies, the different types. Um, and I'll mention one more, and then I'll move on. I'm sorry. But the active gaming equipment, like the, the funky moves, the, the cones that light up, are a blast. Because when you hit, hit them with the ball, if you, you kick a ball and hit it, if you throw a ball and hit it, if you just tag it, it you know the lights go off. It makes sounds and noises. Uh, very sensory, adaptive. It's, it's just a lot of fun as well. So there's, there's active gaming equipment that, you know, the younger kids, my, my kid's been doing it since she was three. She's been doing most of the equipment. So very, very much uh, would, would work with the kindergarten class. Great. Um, good question. Uh, specific to one of the apps you mentioned, is iMuscle a free app? <laughs> I think it was free when it came out, but that's okay. a good question. I haven't checked in a while because I've had it on my iPad. Um, there's sure. different variations of the eye muscle. Um, I do think now it's a few bucks. And then there's right. other ones that are actually even more in-depth that go through and show actual videos. Um, those might be a little more expensive, $3.99, $4.99. Um, once again, when I, ha when I do the webinar with, with apps specifically, I will be able to give much more detail on some of these ideas. But eye muscle is just one example that you can look up. Uh, but there's there's other ones as well that might be offered for free that that would simply you know certainly do possibly what you're wanting for it to do. Okay. Um, question about iPads at at school, and you touched on this a little bit with the question about kindergarten, um, and I'm sure you've seen just a wide variety of technology availability for students in schools, whether or not it's you know every every kid in the school has an iPad or it's you know, one, iP one iPad for each teacher, whatever, but maybe you can speak to kind of um, the variety and how teachers have used it in, you know, both ends of the spectrum where it's, you know, a class iPad or, you know, every kid in the school. Right, right. Some schools, and, and our county here, um, we're very lucky in Florida, uh, at least my students are, I feel, because we have the, one of the, the largest counties in the country. We're the seventh largest, and it's extremely diverse. And we have some schools that have written grants, so all the kids, have iPads, and then we have other schools that do not hardly use technology at all. So we get to experience both realms. The teachers really struggle. It, it, it's very hard because every kid in the class is not going to have an iPad. Um, that's going to be rare. And then even if they all had an iPad, that's a completely different way of being able to work with your curriculum or even if you needed to use that. Most of the time right now, we have used iPads for stations. So some teachers have been lucky enough to be able to use them and even use other teachers' iPads and have gotten them just for a particular part of the curriculum and put them in stations. And it's really neat, too. They, you can even use, you know, I've used my, my own smartphone in one of the stations where they have uh, QR codes. And the little kids just go around and they scan, you know, the, the QR code that I make and they just start doing the activity, and it's a blast. It's almost like a hidden treasure secret that they're figuring out when they uncover this code. And then it tells them where to go next, so it's like a scavenger hunt. But the idea of scanning it and reading it is, is just fun for them. So the idea of having an, an iPad or, or a smartphone for every student is not really feasible right now for most schools and for most teachers. But being able to use it, even if you had one, in a station, while you might have three or four other stations with students doing something related to the topic of your content, that that one particular station uses the iPad for sure. videos or for learning and, and different activities. Okay, good. Um, do you know if Chromebooks can be used to scan QR codes? I didn't think so, but you, you have more experience than that. I Actually, no, I don't know that answer. I do, okay. I do not yeah, know that totally answer. Not totally sure either. And then uh, the name of the app again that you use to shake up the names? Um, Team Shake 
is that one. Team Shake. There are other ones, but Team Shake is, is simple, it's fun, it's easy, and, you know, when the kids see the hat jumping up and down, it's like a magic trick, and then all of a sudden their names are everywhere, and they're trying to find it, and they can, like, run to their colors or their team numbers, and it, right. it, it's really neat to use it for that. Um, and I did see someone, um, thank you, someone did say I muscle with 299 so okay. they, they have Good. upped the price a little bit. Good. And this is a question I think that probably could have its own uh, webinar dedicated to it, but what are some of the ways that you've funded the technology for physical education classes, whether through grants or local? The one person who asked the question is in Miami, um, but what are some of the ways that you'd suggest to fund technology? Well, down in Miami, they're lucky. You have Jane Greenberg down there um, who every time she writes a grant, it seems to get funded. Um, <laughs> I've worked with her in, in multiple occasions, but typically the the equipment that has been funded has been through a grant. So whether it's through the PIP grant, um, the county working with a different a particular company, and a lot of teachers are very, very uncomfortable talking about grants because it's scary. But in every county, there's typically someone, if you go to that person and say, I, I would like this in my class, how can we do it, what grants are out there, they typically will guide the grant process and, and look for the funding that, that is available. Also reaching out to universities that are willing to work with you um, is another idea to where you can write a grant with a university and have some sort of partnership in that manner as well. But the, the funding is the complicated part. And in another webinar, we'll talk about the financial strain because, you know, we may want all these wonderful things, but it, it, it does cost money. And as physical education teachers, we know that's just not something we get every year. Right. And that reminded me, there was a webinar done a year or so ago by Joe McCarthy. It's in our list of webinars if you check it out on our website. But he did one specifically on fundraising. And one of the things I remember coming out of that is that a lot of teachers – um, you know, just just are are kind of scared to pick up the phone and even call businesses. You know, here in Minnesota, where we're at Target headquarters, he said he called up Target and uh, you know they gave him some money. So I think you know that's another way just to, to ask. Reaching uh, out in the community. The yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I see um, this question here, um, and yeah. this is a good one, real quick. Um, someone asked about um, some sort of extra gaming activity or app that's good for wheelchair users or walker users. Um, I, I do know with, with Dance Dance Revolution, and I've actually used this with some of our students too um, in wheelchairs, you can actually set them to where they have a stick um, with their hand, and instead of using their feet, they, it, it's, like a, it, 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 it's not a specific type of stick. You can get anything that has a soft end. They're able to use the stick to follow the beat and to use the arrows. And that's been very, very, very successful. Um, there's, there's other extra game activities out there. It, there's um, light up walls. And once again, when we go into, these are really good questions because when I go into extra gaming and active gaming on a separate webinar, I'm going to be discussing the part of disabilities to where those things can be answered there. But there are definitely activities out there available. Good, good. Um, let's see, I think... We might have gotten through all of the questions here. Um, I'm going to, I do want to announce the winner of our FitStep Pro pedometer, the 15 pack. The winner is, well, before I get to that, um, just a quick reminder that the um, certificate of participation will be emailed out as well as a notification when the recorded webinar is available. And also keep an eye out for uh, details. Uh, May 18th will be the next webinar, and this will, that will be part two, as Lisa mentioned. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Lisa, for your presentation. Our winner is Rhonda Abel, a PE teacher at Kingsway Christian School in Indiana. Rhonda will get that on its way. And again, thanks for joining us. Keep an eye out for more details on the webinar on the 18th for registration, and we hope you will join us again. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone.